Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today I'm going to be doing a whole uh, series of videos. I'm going to start my whole series of videos on the Dragon Sicilian, starting with this one. Uh, and if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So we're going to be taking a look at the Dragon after e4, c5, knight of 3, d6, uh, d4, cd4, knight d4, knight of 6, knight c3. And then here there's this big decision point. You can choose the Dragon with g6, you can choose the Knight Orf with a6, or you can choose a classical with either knight c6 or e6 would be some type of classical or shenanigan. So in this major decision point, we're going to you know make the choice to play g6, which is a very, very aggressive opening. It's one of the most aggressive openings in chess, and it's one of the most double-edged and one of the most dangerous. So just to give you an idea of kind of what the theory is and what the obligations are here, of course, there's a lot of options here, and you have to be very, very well prepared. Like in the Dragon Sicilian, I would say that like 90% of the Dragon Sicilian is, is just knowing theory. You need to know the theory in the Dragon Sicilian. It's very easy to end up in a completely lost position uh, if you do not know theory. Another thing about playing the Dragon Sicilian is you are kind of obligated in a lot of variations and a lot of lines to sacrifice material. And sometimes these sacrifices are intuitive and sometimes they're obvious and sometimes they're not. But you are obligated at some point usually to sacrifice material to make your position work. Um, so you have to be prepared to do that. If you want to play a position where you're not going to sacrifice material, do not play the Dragon Sicilian. Uh, so we're just going to take a look at some basic ideas and some basic concepts behind the Dragon Sicilian. And this is just kind of an introduction to to the dragon. So we're going to have bishop e3, uh, bishop g7, and then we're going to have the move uh, f3, and then we're going to have knight c6. Now, it's interesting to note that this is just a normal kind of good manners move to bring out your knight before you castle, uh, but in the case where they've already played f3, it's not necessarily an obligation, because usually the move knight c6 is to try to coax the move f3 out of you know white if they've played some other move order like, say, bishop c4. We want to throw in knight c6, to kind of obligate them to play the move f3 or obligate them to defend this pawn on e4 somehow because maybe we're throwing in some trick at some point with knight takes e4. So after queen d2, castles kingside, we're in the main line. And now uh, white has two options in this position. He has castles queenside and he has this other option of bishop c4. So the main purpose of this video is really just to kind of, you know, show you kind of what the main ideas are here. Um, this begins what's known as the Yugoslav dragon. And the Yugoslav dragon kind of highlights the main ideas of the dragon Sicilian pretty perfectly. Uh, white will castle queenside, black will be castled kingside. Both sides are going to be attacking on opposite wings. In these situations, material really does not matter because whoever gets there first wins. Now, the critical location that everybody is going to be fighting over in these positions is going to be the d5 square. And there's a big reason for that. After white castles queenside, and after white plays h4, h5, and pries open this h file, and plays bishop h6 to get rid of the dark squared bishop, the only thing keeping black from getting checkmated is this knight on f6. So if white can somehow get rid of this knight on f6, the game will effectively be over. And the easiest way to do that is to play knight d5. So what black has to do is he has to get his exchange sacrifice on the c3 square locked and loaded. And a lot of times we need to sacrifice that exchange even if it doesn't win material. So this is a mistake that a lot of people make when they see dragon games and they study the theory. They think that the exchange sack on c3 is an offensive sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that's done to break up the pawns around the white king, etc., etc. But in reality, it's actually a defensive sacrifice. So to give you an understanding of why, I'm just going to go through kind of an, a main line here where white plays this the most straightforward strategy possible in the bishop c4 line. So bishop c4, if you don't know, it's to prevent the move point to d5, which would have been possible if white chose to castle queenside immediately. So if white castled queenside immediately, we could immediately follow up with d5. And right now, this is basically the only totally respected move in the position. Uh, back when I played, there was two moves here. There was knight d4 and d5. Now it's kind of just d5 is... is the only real try because <laughs> we have computers and we know better. So um, we, we have uh, uh, bishop c4, bishop d7, castles queenside, and then we're going to have knight e5. This is a move order I prefer. I just like to attack the bishop directly. You can also play rook c8 and set up a cute little, um, you can play rook c8 and if they fail to retreat the bishop, you're setting up kind of cute shots with stuff like knight g4 or, you know, um, things like that. So uh, for, for example, let's say rook c8, uh, king, 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 D, King B1, we would have knight takes d4, which threatens the bishop on c4. And then if you play bishop d4, we have rook c4 winning the bishop. And if queen d4, we would have knight to g4. So some people like to play for this trap because this would effectively, uh, you know, win a piece and win the game. So you can, you can play for that trap if you want. Um, it probably doesn't cost you anything. 
<laughs> it's it's reasonable to play this way. Okay, but the other way is just to play rook knight e5, just, uh, just attack it and force it to go back directly, uh, make that bishop decide where it's going to go, then play rook c8, we have the same thing. So now uh, black is threatening rook takes c3, and this is really, really critical because we need to take on c3 if things start getting really, really dicey. So an example would be if, if white was just really, really straightforward. So if we have h4 with the idea of h5, uh, you know, white's coming. So black has to start getting something going here. So that's why black has to play knight c4 right away here. Not because knight c4 is some ideal exchange or anything like that, but just because black needs to get counterplay on the queen side quickly, and that's going to involve breaking up um, all of the defensive resources that white has around his king right now, and he needs to just get rid of one of these bishops. He needs to get rid of either the light squared bishop or the dark squared bishop. The The preferential one would be the dark squared bishop. If, if black got a hold of this dark squared bishop, that would be a very good thing because it's very difficult to ever mate black if he's got his dark squared bishop and white does not have his. It's very difficult because you can open up the h file and you can get your queen all the way to h7 and all the king has to do is step to f8 and there's nothing. There's no follow up with bishop h6. So usually white will take with bishop takes c4, we have rook takes c4, and then we have h5 just prying open the h file with reckless abandon, just trying to pry everything open by sacrificing material and going for mate. So knight h5 g4, knight back to f6, bishop h6. As previously stated, White's playing for mate. So now we get into this tactical melee, and you have to know exactly what to do here as black to survive if you're playing this line with the black pieces. You would first play knight takes e4 here. This is a tactic that works, so we play it. We, we gain an extra pawn. We're also threatening to play rook takes d4 uh, because we have a double attack on the d4 square with the rook and with the bishop. So now this kind of forces White's next move. White has to play the move queen to e3. Again, White doesn't care so much. He's playing for mate. So now we have this huge, 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 huge obligation here. We are obligated to sacrifice the exchange. And I mean obligated. We, we don't have an option. So if we were to just play something that appears safe in our brains, because this position is not safe, we, we're getting made it here. If we were to retreat, knight f6, we would have bishop g7, king g7, queen h6, king back, and then the knight could either go to e4 or d5. So even if the e4 pawn were still on the board, Knight d5 would come, and this game would be effectively over. The threat of knight f6 followed by queen h7 mate is unstoppable. We are dead here. We are completely dead in every possible way. So this game would be effectively over after knight d5. And that is why it's super, super critical that we take on the c3 square with our rook. So another example is if we were to take with the knight, so rook c3 is, is completely obligatory. So rook c3, and then say something like bc3, and then knight f6, this is the obligatory way to survive. So if we play knight takes c3 instead, we are completely lost. Why? Because this knight cannot get back to the f6 square to defend our position. So white could continue with bishop g7, king g7, queen h6, and of course if, if king g8, we have queen h7 mate. And if the king comes out, this is complete suicide by the way, we would just play g5, keeping the king even further out in the open. The king now has to go to the e5 square. If that doesn't look incredibly unsafe to you, I don't know what else does. But white's move here is just incredibly simple, just taking the knight. And of course, black's position is completely, utterly, totally lost. Um, the material is even, or close enough to even. And this black king is on e5, and black has one piece developed on c4. The major material is even. Uh, you know, black has a couple extra pawns, but this is not worth a couple extra pawns. I think the computer gives something like plus 8 or plus 9 here for white. So black is going to have to sacrifice a bunch of material to avoid getting made it here. So um, that position is completely winning for for white. So we have to play this move. We have to play rook takes c3, and then we have bc3. We have knight coming back to f6 to defend. And now we're going to have white continue in this straightforward fashion. We're going to have bishop g7, king g7, queen h6 check. And this is how critical it is to memorize theory. This, this first line that I'm giving you to give you the ideas behind the dragon Sicilian is also a line that if you're going to play the Dragon Sicilian and you're going to play the Rook C8 line, you have to memorize this line. And if you don't memorize this line, you will lose. Even at this point, I know we're 20 moves in, you have to have at least 21 moves of theory memorized. Otherwise, if you play the Dragon Sicilian and you play this line, you will lose every single time. So you need to be prepared to memorize this far in. Because if you play the mistake King G8, you'll be lost. If you play King H8, your position is fine. So like king g8, why is king g8 lost? Well, it's because of a straightforward attacking line. g5, knight h5, rook takes h5, g takes h5, rook h1. So very direct threat of rook h5, followed by queen h7 mate. 
Now black has to play queen c8 in order to play bishop to f5. It's also possible to play queen a5. They're effectively the same move because after rook takes h5, we have to play bishop f5 so we don't get mated. No other move is possible. And the same would be true if our queen were on a5. It would be, like I said, the same position. So bishop f5, knight f5, queen f5, and then is pause the video and see if you see the win here for white. The win is g6. So the point is, is we're threatening mate on h7. Uh, we're also threatening to take the queen on f5, but if we take on the uh, g6 square with our queen, rook g5 wins the queen and wins the game. Now, of course, this entire continuation is not possible if um, back here we were to simply play the move king h8, and then everything is fine. Now, if white continues with the same line, knight uh, g5, knight here, uh, rook takes h5, g takes h5, rook here, we could simply defend by playing rook to g8 to g7, and our position is completely fine. So that's kind of the level of stuff that you have to know just to survive in the Dragon Sicilian and to survive the theory. Um, you have to understand that this sacrifice on c3, it's an obligatory defensive sacrifice that takes place in pretty much every Yugoslav variation of the Dragon Sicilian. So if you're going to play the Yugoslav, no matter what variation you play, you need to be prepared to play the Rook Capture C3 sacrifice at the correct moment. And if you don't play that sacrifice, um, unfortunately, um, you're going to get mated. And even if you do play the sacrifice, you need to know your exact move order very, very carefully uh, so that you don't get mated. So, so anyways, uh, that's kind of your introduction to the ideas behind the Dragon Sicilian and how and why we play the exchange sack in the Dragon. Uh, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess. Uh, thank you very much for watching.